One, two, three, four. This is Mike Malinan, the drummer for Buffalo, New York's The Goo Goo Dolls from 1994 to 2013. The band might be best known for their hit single Iris from the 1998 movie City of Angels, but had an array of high rotation smashes, including Name, Naked, Slide, Black Balloon, Dizzy, Broadway, Here Is Gone, Better Days, Stay With You, Let Love In, Home, and a cover of Supertramp's Give a Little Bit. They even did a rocked up cover of the classic Take Me Out to the Ball Game. The band has had 19 top 10 singles on various charts and have sold more than 12 million albums worldwide. They have won or been nominated for countless Grammy Awards, Records of the Year, MTV Video Music Awards, Billboard Awards, Teen Choice Awards, ASCAP Awards, and Radio Music Awards, as well as being added to Guitar Center's Walk of Fame. Mike was the backbone of a three-piece band during all this success. While laying down tasteful grooves with unpenetrable meter, he snuck in his North Texas chops throughout the hits, resulting in air drumming classic fills. Mike was born in Washington, D.C. and then moved to Miami, Florida. He got his first percussion schooling at the University of Miami before moving on to North Texas State, where he excelled, and where Greg Bissonette graduated years before him. After the mysterious departure from the Goo Goo Dolls in 2013, Mike jumped on board with Tanya Tucker and her band based in Nashville. He is still currently touring with Tanya as the band director in what he would deem a perfect fit for this part of his career. He also has a band called the 40 Marshes, which was established back in 2007. Besides being an awesome rock dad, Mike is an avid ultra runner, having completed several 100 mile races, 50 milers, 50K runs, and marathons. He just recently challenged himself to a 4448 challenge. Four miles every four hours for 48 hours. I was a runner before my accident as well, so I was especially curious about his physical maintenance program and overcoming pain while touring and recording in the studio. Let's check in with him. There we go. I think that, is, that works. I'm kind of centered now. So cool? I would never do the social thing like before shows on tour, but I would always be gone. They're like, where's Burke? Where's Burke? Right. And, right. and I would, I was just running basically like random towns, you know, I'd, I would run around a Walmart parking lot. I would run, <laughs> I'd run alongside tra uh, railroad tracks in Arizona. It like didn't matter. I just right. needed to get out. And, yeah. I think That's cool. Yeah. 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 I yeah. miss those endorphins. Like you get really creative. I bet, you know, while you're running uh, it definitely keeps you sane i mean yeah, yeah. i've done it for years so yeah. but now that i'm quarantined you know it's got nothing else to do so see so, yeah, i'm doing this four 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 forty eight challenge right now as i started today so i'm a quarter of the way through which is it's pretty cool so far i've never heard about one but i discovered it two weeks ago it's like the new trend now you're supposed to get a ton of miles in without really stressing your body you never run more than four miles yeah well soon i feel like at four in the morning i gotta run at midnight and then four in the morning and then eight in the morning so <laughs> You should we'll see what happens. Um, ben Gibbard from Death Cab for Cutie. He's like an ultra ultra runner now. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I've run. I've run with Ben a bunch of times. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so, how's um, how have you been in Nashville the whole time? No, I've been here about six years. Okay. Yeah. I have a good buddy from the, the old days who lives out there. I'm not sure which town, but just outside of Nashville, and he makes bass pickups. Uh, yeah. I think Gnarly Bass is his is his thing on. Um, Facebook There's so many of these companies here. Yeah, I can't right. keep track. I've never stayed there for a long period of time. I've always been just passing through. But mm -hmm. in, in August, I'm uh, endorsed by Mapex, and there was a, an artist summit there. And <clears throat> um, yeah, yeah, everybody and, was Mapex. 
that's centered here, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that was a lot of fun, but I was able to spend an extended time there at least a few days and mm -hmm. wow. Like I, I never knew it was that busy, you know, pre quarantine, just music everywhere within a few blocks just oh, yeah. I, all yeah. i saw so were musicians dragging gear across the street like it was south by southwest you know uh -huh. yeah downtown broadway's like that all the time so there's a big scene there i mean it's you know some people make a pretty good living playing down there it's like the you know it's it's, it's where all the tourists go it's tourist money it's, it, it comes and goes as to how cool it is sometimes there's great players down there sometimes there's not so yeah. But it's and unfortunately, it's you know when you're playing for tips for the tours, they all want to hear the same songs over and over. So like every fiddle player I know there ends up playing Devil Went Down to Georgia forty times. <laughs> you know, so that can happen. That but, I can see getting into that rhythm, you know, where you're, you're making some money, but you're you're just especially if you write, if you're a songwriter, if you're trying to yeah, yeah. get out of that, it can be difficult. You know, go to L.A. or New York, or or do I want actually want to make some money and stay there and playing cover bands, yeah. et cetera. But is that where Tanya is based also? Yeah, she's, she's in Nashville, always has been, yeah. Almost, uh, yeah, like all the, especially the, most of the heritage country artists, they're all here, yeah. Yeah. Everything, yeah, because that, that whole scene has always been based out of here. So, I mean, she's originally from Arizona and then lived in Texas for years, but, you know, she's, musically, she's always been based out of Nashville. Um, so I, I mentioned I play with Duff and his band, it's called Loaded, mm -hmm. and um, I know that they're, pretty good friends with her. I've seen them take photos at airports and, and whatever. Oh yeah. So oh cool. I've never, I think I met, I think I was in Spokane airport and Tanya was in there once a long time ago, but I think the McKay yeah. like they're good friends. That um, could be. <laughs> she knows everybody. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just a little background. So, <clears throat> you know, I've been, I've been playing forever. Um, I was touring around in the nineties when, when you were exploding and cool. that's, that's when I, um, you know, I heard, heard you on the radio. And mm -hmm. so last year I was playing with Roger Fisher from heart. He was trying to get this band together to go out and tour and do all the heart stuff. It's, you know, cause uh. there was in this area in Seattle, there's like 17 heart cover bands, you know? And he was just like, Not I wrote right. the stuff. Like I want to start my own thing and start making money. You know? yeah, so yeah. Yeah. I was invited into, to, to play that. And the second show, the first, first show of the tour, um, I was, I was driving home through the mountains and uh, it, we just had a huge snowstorm <clears throat> and I lived, I lived in the mountains outside of Seattle and there's switchbacks. I got ejected out of my car mm. and um, ended up breaking ribs and had spine surgery and my ear was hanging yeah. off. Blah, blah. So it's like my whole career came to, to a whole, I was paralyzed for 48 hours, blah, blah. Wow. So this last yeah. year I've been making my way back and I'd say I'm like 75, 80% drummy mm -hmm. back or at least where I mean, my ego was. Um, right. I'm able to teach. I have a little school. I'm able to play, <clears throat> but I'm still working on like little things like, uh, especially quickness and, and power and stuff like that. So I was like, outside of, uh, to deflect the self pity. I, what if I like, uh, talk to my drum heroes who inspired me in the first place to play mm -hmm. and they can share some positive things. Maybe that's mm -hmm. some stories. And then, my first four requests of my or why I wanted to play drums in the first place, they all said yes. And so I'm like, Oh, oh I got to make something legitimate now. Like they want to be involved. Like Martin, Alan White. Um, right. And then uh, and next week is Sheila E. I can't, I can't believe that one, but um, cool. you, yeah, drummers are pretty, drummers are pretty accessible, especially these days. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you um, or, or drummers who have a sound, like I just interviewed Kelly from failure another oh, cool. they exploded in the 90s and mm -hmm. um you definitely have a sound like you, you're you made i know you went to school and you were way past greg this and that he went to north texas also yeah yeah he went before me but he was still floating around i definitely met him i didn't know him well but i definitely met him but by i mean by the time i saw him there he was already playing with david lee roth at the yeah Star in like yeah. the what 86 87 something like that yeah. So, uh, but he was still floating around. He'd been teaching right before then. But I think Greg is, yeah, four or five years older than me. So I really didn't get to know him until we got to LA. And then, you know, hung out with him a bit out there and we'd talk about North Texas and everything else. But I haven't seen him since I moved to Nashville. So I haven't really stayed in touch with him. <clears throat> so what, what, I, what I noticed about your style, and I was touring around at the same time. You guys were gigantic. And we, were, we just got signed to Reprise and Howie Klein. Mm -hmm was the president at the time and he was an A&R &R guy too. But I would hear these hits, you know, out of the radio. It's like, that's, you know, 
God, you know, they really know how to write hits. But then when I started paying attention to the drums, it's, you know, I would say your sound is just like rock solid, you know, and then <laughs> cool, deceptive, thanks. deceptively tricky, you know, like to me, <laughs> at that time I was just kind of like, I was going from, you know, self-taught guy and then now I'm signed and I'm touring and I think I'm pro, you know, but when I hear songs mm -hmm. for, that you record, it's like, that is where I need to be is as far as like confidence and, chops and both in studio and and live mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then um once that band eventually folded i actually started i had a, a side job with reprise as doing just whatever i moved down to la and i was i was helping our um this guy named eric fritchie um and he invited me to um to westwood this, uh, so we're talking like 98, 99 or something like that to, to see this okay. private, it was a private show. I think the movie just came out and you were in some small place with full strings doing, uh -huh. doing Iris and, and, uh, and other hits, but it's like, it was so, it was just, a, it was just industry guys. And I'm sitting, standing yeah. in the front row. I don't, know if, I don't know if you remember this particular show. I wish I could remember. I'm trying to remember that particular. <laughs> I know we did some string thing in New York, but um. Uh, they're like the movie just came out <laughs> and he's like yeah come check this out it's a private thing i was like okay whatever but i was like i was able to stand front and center and like watch you and i was like you know i've heard this song these pop songs on the radio but now i'm like okay i get it like this guy this guy's educated he's he's got super chops but he's he's playing to the song he's playing for the band and i and i totally get it because you would throw in these fills sometimes just like whoa where did that come from <laughs> so normally you know normally you're just pl yeah. uh, playing the script yeah <laughs> that's, yeah that's what the offspring sure. singer told me once when i was auditioning he's like just play the script you know? but um mm -hmm. yeah your team player and uh, uh, that's when i developed a like, huge respect for you oh thanks so i was just reaching out i wanted you to be included in this because um obviously you're an athlete Mm. And, um, so this is about like, <clears throat> maybe pe musicians might be in the same spot. They've had, they've had something major happen or, or just nagging things that they have to deal with on the road and like certain techniques yeah. or tricks that they use in their daily maintenance. <clears throat> you would might want to throw out there to, to people, for instance, right. Vitamins or yoga or meditation. Um, I'm sure with all the running combined with the drumming, I mean, it's gotta be so hard. On, on yeah that. yeah it can be i mean i've had issues over the years i've had uh i had to have, actually right when i moved here so it's been almost six years now, i had to have wrist surgery which is scary yeah of course so i had uh i had de Quervine's tendonitis which they say you only have to have surgery in five percent of cases but i was one of those five percent so wow. i basically couldn't play at all so i was between gigs so and luckily when i got it was fortunate because i couldn't play for about six months mm -hmm. but it was uh so I, you know, getting wrist surgery is always, of course, kind of scary. I have to tell the doctor, I said, well, I play drums for a living. So, and, and he kind of was taken aback. He goes, oh, okay. So <laughs> you need basically all your dexterity back. And they told me that in general, when they do the surgeries, you know, in good cases, you get 85, 90% back. And honestly, I can't notice. Hmm. So it, it I, I, you know, I was very hardcore in rehabbing because I knew it was important. And the only way I can tell I even had anything is if I, if I lift something really heavy, I can kind of feel my wrist if I'm holding it straight. But as far as playing and everything, it's, it's been completely fine ever since the surgery. So that's good. But I do remember rehabbing was kind of funny because they gave you these exercises and I was on them, you know, doing as much as I could. Of course, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to take it lightly, hoping I could play again. And um, I was rehabbing at a place that like all the Vanderbilt athletes, I guess, rehab. So I thought it was pretty funny because these guys are doing weights and on these treadmills and doing the you know, football players doing their rehab. And I'm sitting at a table, like doing these hand exercises like this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So all these guys doing all these serious equipment. I thought it was, just, it was kind of odd, but it, but it worked wonders. But, um, yes, yeah, so that was all that, that occupational therapy. Yeah. In the yeah. hospital where I, was, I had these pap these, these clips for laundry and I had to, Cause I couldn't move. I was paralyzed for like 48 hours. I, I was trying to yeah. clip these things to a line, you know? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Occupational. Yeah, I did get a drum set delivered to the hospital. Now? What's that? How long, you been, how long have you been rehabbing now? Uh, so, well, I got out of the hospital about a year exactly from mm -hmm. now. And I actually played a show two weeks after I got out and that was a huge mistake. Yeah. I was yeah. 
halfway through the show, I was like leaning, I couldn't hold my head up, you know, but it was all pride. And I was like, no, right. I was actually yelling at Roger for, while I was in a neck brace in the hospital. Like you can't replace me. I didn't yeah. cancel You canceled, you know, and like totally yeah. no perspective. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I ch jumped back in, I jumped back in way too early and I played another stuff. And then uh, Ben Smith, um, who I consider one of my mentors, he's out here, he played for heart forever. And, uh, he hooked me up with um, a couple mellower bands, like a Tower of Power cover band, and mm. this guy named Leroy Bell, who wrote some songs for Elton John, um, just really mellow three-piece R&B stuff. And that was really mm. helpful in coming, because I didn't have to jump back into the aggressive eight on the floor, ga, 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 right. you know, right away. I can kind of like work myself up. And it's, it's gradually coming up, but um, yeah, uh, I totally understand like, you know, being in a, in a gym or something and every, everyone's going for it and you're just doing these uh -huh. little, little movements. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but everything seems to be fine now, but you know, the, I mean, I've been with Tanya for four years now. Yeah. And you know, it's a very different gig. And so it's not as physical as the rock gigs were in LA, which is probably a good thing. You know, I remember, you know, musicians were always aware of getting older. You know, yeah. and I remember when I got the call, for the gig and they said you know would you be interested tanya is a drummer and my first thought was cool age appropriate gig and i'm not trying to be a kid anymore <laughs> and, <laughs> but um you know it was, it was definitely interesting coming to nashville and hopping into that kind of music it was totally different but uh, luckily i'd played with enough sort of country artists local guys getting my chops down and getting the feel down which is a totally different world but one of the one of the things that was tough for me to adapt to was trying to get the intensity without playing with the volume because, you know, rock guys, we're, we're all the same. We all just hit stuff really hard. I think that's where you get all the intensity from. And as you get older, you realize that's not where it comes from. But, mm -hmm. but I think also physically that's good for me because, you know, with the wrist surgery and getting older and everything else, I haven't really, you know, knock on, knock on floor time. I haven't had any physical issues since I've been with her. And I think a lot of it is just the fact that we're playing at a much lower volume. Um, yeah, but it is definitely, it's definitely interesting trying, like, like doing that to try to get the um, – try to get inspiration and try to get a lot of energy without playing hard. You know, it's a different, it's a different world. I used to not get that, you know, and, and I, I, I didn't understand, especially the old country, even though I knew, I knew some of the players, but some of the players are great. And yeah. even, you know, even session guys like Matt Chamberlain, who I've known forever, you know, he comes to Nashville and plays in tons of records and he's got that stuff down pat. So I knew some of the players were great, but I didn't really understand the music you know, until I was actually with Tanya for a while. Okay. And she really was turning me on to some of the older artists and the Merle Haggards and the George Joneses and really getting deep into their catalogs. And I'd listen to them like, this is, it's, it's some really, really crazy good playing. But um, yeah, I think again, because, you know, my heroes were, were growing up were Keith Moon and John Bonham and hard hitters, you know? So it was different. So when you see guys really sitting back and just shuffling quietly, I didn't get that when I was younger. You know, I didn't get the skill that it, that it took and just how good those guys were. Yeah, so not only are you learning from here, it's cool. Yeah. Inspired when you're young to play this, this rock stuff because it's just so fun. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. you go out, you, when you get signed, you go out, you have some stuff on the radio and you're touring with kind of like-signed bands or whatever. And you're, and you're t t watching other drummers. And subconsciously, you're competing, you know, like oh, yeah. in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, the bands that I were in, you know, there's festivals and it's just like, oh, I thought we were the only ones who sounded like that, you know, and then you get like <laughs> 20 bands mm -hmm. where the singer's screaming and tying the microphone cord around his neck and jumping into the drum kit. And it's like, everyone's doing this, you know, and you're just, gotta yeah. go. it's, there's no dynamics whatsoever. You're just competing. And, uh, you know, maybe really that's how I thought about the Warped Tour after a while. It just seemed like a lot of those and some of those bands are great, mm -hmm. but it just seemed like it was it was just started to get really one dimensional really quickly, you know, bummed me out. But I think that's kind of a, I mean, that's been a problem in music for for years now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of that's mixing and radio and, you know, you know, the whole game. So, I mean, it's, it seems like for years, at least in the late 90s, radio stations wanted everything to be one dimensional so that the, the meters would stay up. So the radio station would be loud. So bands started to follow suit. Yeah. Um, so I, I do teach. I have a little school here called Loud House. And it's, it's, it's boys and girls from like 6 to 17. And I developed this thing called a drummer's tool belt to where if they were going to be serious about it, to have these certain things in place where they can walk into any room 
and be able to provide, you know, if someone said, Hey, um, you know, like 16th notes, uh, uh, triplets shuffle mm -hmm. versus straight. Like here's, here smells like team spirit straight. Here smells like team spirit as a shuffle. Um, <laughs> the Bo Diddley beat, um, mm. uh, 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 I call it uh, naughty boy, which is right. And grasshopper <laughs> things that you hear in, in pop songs all the time, you know, and right. Yeah. I was I was wondering, like, what besides those, like, what what would you what would you inject into that? Is like the very basis of of little little people who actually love music so much they might want to do that, play drums as a living. What else oh gosh, doing? just like I I mean I always say, you know, just just start playing with songs. Yeah. I mean it's you know the the forty year old rule still it still is in play. Just play along to back and black. You can't do wrong with that. <laughs> That's what Greg Bissonette said. He said, did yeah, you forget, say the same record? <laughs> did you forget about this one? Yeah. It's like, no, yeah, that and four on the floor, you know, of um, course, of course. Well, the reason it is, the reason I, I think, you know, and everybody, it's, it's funny, you know, because when I was a kid, I always, I always, I always remember this. And when I was a kid, you know, the two big rock records that came out right around the same time, I think within six months of each other, were ACDC Back in Black and Rush Moving Pictures. Mm. And when I was a kid, I was just, of course, totally in the Neil Peart and totally in the Rush and, and, and didn't understand that it's absolutely phenomenal drumming on both records. I didn't understand that until years later. Right. And then you go back as an adult, you listen to Back in Black and just the how, how solid Phil Rudd plays. And yeah, yeah, the parts themselves are simple, but they're so perfectly executed for the songs. And just there's that. I mean, that is one of the most confidently played records of all time. That's why I think. You know, you can't do wrong playing along to those songs because the kids can play the parts. They're easy, but you can't sound like that. Yeah. Because it's, it's phenomenal. And that's, something, and that's something I think a lot of younger kids miss. I mean, obviously, you know, Rush is great, but you're drawn to that because, you know, it's, it's technical. It's much more technical. So you learn those kind of parts. But, you know, you're not, not going to end up being in a band like Rush, most likely. You're probably more likely, as a professional, going to end up playing a lot more songs that are straightforward rock songs like ACDC. Yeah. So it's 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 probably more important to get comfortable playing that kind of stuff than it is learning how to play limelight. You know, even though you know they both have their places. But as far as the working musician goes, you know, I, I, you're you're gonna you're gonna fall back on your ACDC a lot more than you're gonna fall back on your rush. And so I think that's key with a lot of kids. I know, you know, when I've taught before, kids have come over and been like, you know, teach me how to play that slipknot beat. I'm like, no, I can't teach you how to play that slipknot beat. <laughs> yeah, you've got to learn some stuff before you can play like that. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, you know, <laughs> get solid with, get, get really, really solid before you go there. You know? Yeah. I had yeah. a, uh, I always thought of, you know, when I was like a freshman in high school or something, when I started to, yeah, I was going to ask you this, this question too. Um, I, when I started putting in a lot of time by myself, I uh -huh. grew up on the beach in Orange County, California, but I didn't mm -hmm. surf and I didn't skate. Um, <laughs> so you were, so you were I, left to do nothing. <laughs> I saw some dude who eventually turned out to be a professional magician at, mm -hmm. at the, uh, in Hollywood. But at the time he, I saw him play Wipeout during lunch, you know, with his yeah. band. And I was like, and I saw the way the people reacted. I was like, Oh my God. Like I was buzzing for days. So, uh, you know, went to the swap meet, bought, bought some drums or whatever. And I spent a lot of time just, just, um, rocking, listening to stuff, listening to vinyl, memorizing the skips, in the vinyl mm -hmm. as fills and stuff like that and then at the time i had a couple other um friends who played drums and when i came back that summer they're like oh my god i want to quit like what happened to you you know and it's just yeah. because they had other interests you know I, this is all i wanted to do and i, I live near disneyland right. I go to disneyland all the time i actually remember going to disneyland and watching josh freeze when he all was right yeah, josh is awesome man. <laughs> he yeah that was I would just sit behind the Tomorrowland Terrace, the thing that popped up, and I would just I'd be there for hours, you know, my friends would be walking mm -hmm. doing their rides and stuff like that. But was there a time uh back in your youth where you put a lot of the time in and maybe you had musicians friends and they were like, Wow, you've jumped to another level? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean I was just that's all I did. Mm -hmm. From about, I'd say from about eighth grade on, that's pretty much all I did. You know, I just I, my my dad had this little little room off to the side of the house and luckily there was it was, it was kind of his study and it was this small little room, but there was a laundry room between the kitchen and the study. So there was this empty space. So it was luckily it was 
far enough away that I could practice drums there. And I would just play all the time, you know. And a lot of it was uh, anybody my age did the same thing. We just learned moving pictures, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, down that and did a lot of that stuff. But um, so, yeah, and I think it was, I'd say about a jun junior year in high school where I felt like I made a leap. And that's kind of when I decided I was going to try to pursue it professionally. But even, even once you become, you know, once you start becoming a professional and start making a living playing drums, you still got a lot to learn. I mean, I remember right. another, I had another leap when I was in my mid twenties, like when I was 24 or 25, I suddenly had this, like, I suddenly figured out how I played and it's, 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 I can't even get more specific than that. And I heard Tom Petty say something once in an interview and that's exactly how I felt is he just, he said this one day he woke up and he goes, Oh, that's what I play. And that's what I write. Okay. Now that I know that I can continue and I can go do it. So somewhere around 24 or 25, I kind of figured out how I played drums and I go, that's how I play. Mm. So every, everything I've done since then has always basically been around. You, you said I have a sound, which is really flattering because that's what anybody goes for. But I think it's, it's all based around that, this vague thing of just sort of figuring out what you do. I go, okay, this is the kind of drummer I am. It's, it's like, yeah, it was, it was fun playing Rush songs. I'm not that kind of drummer. I'm never going right. to be my court. No, I'm not going to be that kind of a player. You'll take things so, from that, but that's not your yeah, style. Yeah. Yeah. So instead, you know, I, I, I spent my time around then, early to mid 20s, you know, learning every Soundgarden song. Because all of a sudden I heard Matt Cameron play. And Matt Cameron had more in common than me. He had, he had incredible chops. But he also had more in common with a guy like Stan Lynch <laughs> yeah. and Tom Petty than he had with a guy like Neil Peart because it was a lot of just really, really solid playing. And of course, you know, just because he's Matt Cameron, he had to throw in impossible stuff in the midst of it <laughs> just because <laughs> yeah. he could. But, but, you know, I listened to like that Temple of the Dog record to this day and it still just holds up so well. I mean, it's one of my favorite drumming records ever, you know. You can't help but be attracted to, to drummers like... Um you know, Neil Peart and Terry Bozio. And, um, and, and I only bring those two up because I was working for Wiener Schnitzel at 14 years old and I had an argument in the kitchen because yeah. I was a Bozio guy. <laughs> yeah. And this guy, the manager, he was like, no man, listen to exit stage left. You don't know what you're talking about. So we like swap <laughs> stuff. And I came back the next day. I was like, wow, you opened up a new portal for me. You know? Yeah. And, but that, but, and I also thought of ACDC as just keg parties. Like, cause I played football mm -hmm. too. It's like, oh, we're going to go, it's just me ACDC on my, but now if I were to say, you know, a kid who, who I see is like really talented and they love yeah, music, yeah, it's like, like, listen to ACDC. Hold on, my kid walked in. What's yeah, yeah, yeah. I have something to eat. Yeah, soon. I'll be down in a minute. Just I'm finishing gonna, up this interview, okay? I'm just going to go eat it. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> I got six-year-old twins, so he just wandered in, said he's hungry. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, so I would say, I would, I would point towards simpler and solid, confident, um, you know, just, just the, because you're going to interfere with the song. You're going to interfere with the hooks. You're going to interfere with the song. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you want. Well, it, it, it always, it, it depends what kind of band you're in too. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, and you always have to remember that too. There's, there's these players that I love, you know, from Keith Moon to Neil Peart, to those kind of guys, like they were also in the right band for that kind of playing style. You can't play like Keith Moon and being and not be in the who it wouldn't make any sense. Cause yeah. you know, he defined what that band sounded like so much. Yeah, and he's not going to so, sound so good in the Beatles. So. Right, exactly. It wouldn't have made any sense. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there is that, you know, the music called the music called for that kind of playing, and those guys really. I mean, you know, those are two classic examples. Obviously, the Who and Rush, because so much of what they sounded like was defined by what the drummer was doing, but the music worked around that. You know, yeah. it doesn't that doesn't happen in your standard gig. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I was talking to Martin of uh, the Pretenders, he was he was mm -hmm. he said that. The way they wrote songs is he played as Chrissy's right hand played. So, you know, I would ask him about how, how he came up with certain grooves or certain fills. Mm -hmm. And it was basically dependent upon her, her right hand. But whenever I try to approach stuff, you know, one of the hardest things for musicians to do is to be completely objective about your playing. So I tend to, I tend to record a part and then go back and listen to it outside of myself and listen to it as if it's somebody else. Mm. And then I go, do I like that or do I not like that? So you can't always tell when you're tracking it. And then when you listen back to it, don't try to listen to the quality of what you just recorded. Listen to what it sounds like to you as a listener, not as a player. Yeah. So I would, I approach songs that way. Um, probably more like a guitar player does than, than a lot of drummers do. And I think that that tends to be a problem with drummers is they just, 
are worried about their part so much instead of making sure that it's working in the song. Yes. You know, it's cool. That it's like I say, it's, it's, it'd be cool to go back and listen out of, out of, out of my own space. Be like, okay, I'm just gonna forget what I play and listen to it as a listener, not as the guy who just played it. Mm-hmm. And then see, you know, see if there's a part that makes me go, wow, that's cool. <laughs> and if there is, then you know, you succeeded, you know? Yeah. Everyone's in the listening back. Everyone's doing the, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. And you know, yeah. you definitely know when money's on the line, when you like think you're done with the record and then you get a phone call, like we got to fly back in because the producer spliced and diced, whatever we got to re-record. <laughs> it was when the big switch was right, right around 2000. And it's, it's been great and it's been terrible because ever since then stuff has just been any recordings I've done with, with any artists that, you know, these engineers will just splice stuff without telling you. And, and I don't care how seamlessly you can splice stuff. The more you do that, the more energy gets taken out of the track. Yeah, I might not be able to tell where the edits are, but if you're editing together seven different takes, there's no energy left. And that's, that's been a problem with music ever since. It drives me insane. I can hear it because yeah. when I listen to back, I, I'll leave the producer unnamed, but uh, a big, uh, very, very close to you. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, he had a guy named The Wolf. That was his editor. And he was in his yeah. little room in his studio in California. And the thing that for non-musician producers is you, there's a crash that comes on the one sometimes and they don't take that into consideration coming out of yeah. the fill going into the one. It's like, there's a crash that should be there and all of a sudden there's silence and it just sounds so weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes that, that, that's just an editing mistake kind of a thing, but, but, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking yeah. about, I always, I always tell every time I, every time I record, I always, tell the engineer i said look just I'd, I'd like to just use one straight take so if you're going to start editing stuff tell me so i'm there right and they usually just do it when you're not there when they're mixing and then you and then you then you hear that energy loss and that's always it's always been a problem yeah and it's just it's just a drag they shouldn't they shouldn't do that <laughs> love it um how do i direct you're doing on are you doing zoom lessons or, or- uh, i'm not right now i should probably start but I haven't really been doing many lessons at all. I was teaching a bit in my house um, last year. Yeah. But it's, it's, to be quite honest, I've just, I've been, you know, just mentally haven't really been inspired. This whole thing's so frustrating. I know I talk to a lot of musicians in the same way. It's like, I should be up here playing drums every day, but I'm not. Yep. Um, so a couple of people that have inquired about lessons, I've sort of have just said, I'm not really interested in doing it right now. I, th- I think that'll change soon. This is becoming a long enough situation that it's time to, you know, teaching sometimes is great for me because it gets, it piques my own interest up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I, it's something I should start doing, Zoom lessons. I'll probably start doing that really, really soon. Do you feel all the running that you've done is um, strengthened? I mean, you say you're not drumming as much, but do, have you ever come into conflict with uh, the soreness or any kind of running, running stuff when it came to shows? Or do you think it's actually um, helping? When it, was, when it was injury related occasionally, I had, I had plantar fasciitis for a couple of years. And that was, it's always questionable as to whether it was caused by running or from hitting my bass drum too hard. Probably a combination of both. <laughs> and so it wouldn't, it was, it, it, it was nagged for two years. I had this two year injury of getting cortisone shots in my foot, of getting MRIs and everything. And it slowly started to go away once the tour ended. So it was obviously a combination. So I wasn't even really running. I was still just playing. And because I was playing, it wasn't, didn't go away. So I spent almost two years not running at one point. So, um, yeah, but I, I mean, in general, running has been great for touring because it, it keeps you in shape. Um, so you can make it through shows. And I think as, as you get older, it gets more and more important. Yes. Stretching. Yeah, yeah, without, stretching. without running, I'd be, you know, so, so, so that's what keeps me in shape. <laughs> definitely keeps 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 the strength up keeps the flexibility up and it's i think playing would be a lot harder if it wasn't doing exercise so i i think any musician especially any touring musician should definitely do some kind of exercise you go crazy and plus you just mentally go crazy if you don't you know you don't have to go you know me and you're talking about ben i remember me and ben went for like a 35 mile run in the forest one day out in los angeles you know which is wow. right before i left yeah he's become a really great ultra iron and um i've run Myself, I've run a bunch of hundred mile races and stuff too. So that's how, that's how we met. Cause, uh, I, I think I reached out to him cause I had heard he's a runner and he knew that I was, you know, that kind of stuff. Not a lot of, not a lot of musicians doing hundred mile trail races. So no, no, no. I sort of met that. I, I, he's, he's another, he's another guy I haven't really seen. I saw Death Cab when they came to town 
and saw him at the Ryman, but I haven't really talked to him much in the last couple of years. Um, but well, well, now I forgot my I forgot my point talking about running. Oh, it was like running uh, injuries and how you think you it was it was actually helpful and most musicians should do that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just talking to him about it as as, as to you know how, how much it mentally helped him. Once he got divorced and everything else, he started running so much and he he got to the point where he goes he goes you have to keep things in perspective. He, he goes at a certain point. He goes once I started really doing these soldiers, I didn't want to play music anymore. I just wanted to go disappear and run in the mountains all day. <laughs> And there is that. So I always look at it. I go, when, when music is your job, you need a hobby. So uh, music is no longer a hobby. So, so running is kind of my hobby. I was, never, I was never fast enough to be competitive, so I just do it for fun. Yeah, I really do miss it. It's just, um, so when you have a, it's a C6, so that's hands and feet, but there is some nerve stuff that goes down the leg, and it's keeping me from yeah. doing that. But, man, the, the creatively – a therapy, you know, it gets out a bunch of anger and it, you go through creative stuff. Once you hit that, you know, runner's high point. I've been swimming a lot, but it's not the same. It's not the same as running to me. Right, yeah. Well, you try walking. Walking helps. You know, that's what I, when I was, I had plantar fasciitis for two years, I just hiked, couldn't run. Mm. So, uh, and that, 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 that's the point that I, that I lost when we were talking about running in the mountains. But I said, anybody who's a touring musician, it's like, you don't have to go do that stuff, but you do need to get off the bus or out of the van and go walk two miles. You know, just do that. Just, I used to, once Yelp came out, it became this great thing. I, when I had breakfast, I'd find a restaurant. I'd be like, okay, I can't, I have to find a breakfast restaurant that's at least one mile away. Because that way I have to walk two miles. <laughs> yeah. I walk to breakfast, I walk back and I go, there's some exercise for the day. If, if nothing else, that's what you're going to do. So otherwise you just sit there and turn to a couch potato really quick on tour. So oh, God. A, yeah. No, I'm not touring is very physical, you know. I mean, I mean, just just being out there and you're never sleeping well. You know what it's like. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like it's just it can be really really exhausting, and people forget that. So one of the best ways to to fight that, I think, is to get just a little bit of exercise. Um, there, even though you know we're going to, through the times we are, I have seen itineraries slowly pop up for next year, several months from now. Yeah, yeah. Are there are you there? Tanya dates, you know, that you see. Yeah, the, 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 the calendar is full right now from September on. I know that's going to change. You know, we were, we had to take emergency flights back from England. We were in, we were in the UK to play some festivals. And after we got there, the festival got canceled. So we basically had to make a run for it and get back to the States. I think it was like March 4th or so. Yeah. Right before, right before they started restricting travel. And um, then I had this bad feeling. I was like, we're done for the year. And it's really a drag. I feel, you know, it's, 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 it's been mentally fatiguing for me. I can't, be, I can't imagine how hard it is for her right now because, you know, she's been out there for 50 years, just about. And then this record comes out. She wins two Grammys. She's never won a Grammy before in her life. Wins two Grammys. The hype is incredible. You know, Brandy Carlisle produced it and wrote the songs on it. And wow. We played a couple shows with her. And it's just, and so all of a sudden we started touring in January and February at this, at this level to where she was back in the day. And I was, you know, you know, we, since I've been with her, we've done a lot of, it's a lot of weekend warrior stuff. It's a lot of the older country artists are, you know, you play Friday, Saturday nights in casinos and come back. So they said, we're going to start selling hard ticket dates, see what happens. So we were playing places like Lincoln, Nebraska and Columbia, Missouri on Tuesday nights and selling them out places we had no business selling out. So it was, everybody was psyched and it looked like this was just going to be this ramp up. We we're going to have this crazy huge summer. And then of course we didn't come to a running halt. So yeah it's really a drag for her. Cause you know, she was about to be at a level she hadn't seen in 15, 20 years, I think. So. <sighs> yeah. The big comeback. I mean, she yeah. never, she was never gone, but like talk about momentum killer. Yeah. So, country music is interesting. It's, 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 uh, it happens in rock a bit too, but, but friends of mine always joke about the fact that say country artists, basically they slide, they slide, they slide. And they say, and then when they turn 60, they get huge again, because then at that point they're heritage artists and they're legends. <laughs> so, yeah. And that was, uh, that her, so. Totally makes sense. <laughs> yeah. uh, so just point everyone towards the website for those dates and further info. Yeah, yeah. If you just go to Tanya's, Tanya's website, all those dates are on there. Um, hopefully, some of them will happen. Where uh, I know in September we were scheduled to play the Pilgrimage Festival, which is a drag because it's like three miles from my house. I was just going to mm. ride my bike there and play a gig, and uh, that's, I doubt that's going to happen. I'm sure that'll be canceled. So we'll we'll see. I mean. 
you know, it's just, it's, it's very frustrating. And I know it's frustrating for, for a lot of people, but Tennessee is, and it's interesting being in Nashville because obviously there are, there's more of a concentration of professional musicians here than probably anywhere in the world. I mean, there's definitely more here than the world. LA, LA, LA was music, but this is seriously like everybody I know <laughs> plays music for a living. That's what I know. Everybody's in the same spot. But it's just, it's, um, yeah, everybody's it's really like If you can play, you can get work Agreed. there. It's, that's what it seems like. It, What's that? Just the networking there, because it's so concentrated. Like, if you can play, if you got some chops, you can get work. You can work in Nashville. Yeah, it's Nashville's like everywhere else. It's it's starting to get a little oversaturated. Mm. So, I mean, I meet people all the time who are like, "I just moved here three weeks ago. How do I get a gig?" And I go, "Well, mm. I, don't, I don't know what to tell you." There's, mm. you know, it's, it's it's I mean, it's like anywhere else. Yes, there's a lot of gigs here, but there are also a lot of musicians here, and and the talent level here is is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, playing in Tanya's band, I've never played with musicians like this in my life, to be quite mm -hmm. honest. It's, it's insane how good these guys are. And it's, it's just really a joy. Yeah. And that's why I'm so happy that I, I landed that gig. It's like, this is, you know, I, I look at this as part two of my music career. And it's been just, it's been great up until we're furloughed right now. Yeah. But it's just been, you know, it's not as high. It's, it's, it's being a backing musician for a singer, you know, it's not a band. It's, it's her. So it's much less high profile, obviously. And that's that's pretty much a good thing <laughs> so so i hang with the band and then and like i say the band are great guys and they're all totally professional and there's no drama and it's just it's it's a lot of fun it's a great gig and you deserve so, it yeah thanks yeah hopefully it starts up again one of these days that's i mean i guess i think there's there's a couple shows i think we have a streaming show in august which i wish i had the details on it but that should happen obviously because it's streaming and I think there might be a couple of outdoor shows that will definitely happen before the end of the year. Socially distanced drive-in shows. Yeah. Sort of thing. Got to get so, some, some gosh, summertime shows. I don't know if that'll kick in. You yeah. Said, and there's a, couple, there's a couple of the bigger casinos that have, you know, the smaller room and the bigger room. So what I've heard they're doing is, you know, we, if we play the, the smaller room, it's 1500 capacity. They also have an 8,000 seat room. So apparently what they've been doing, some of these casinos, is taking the, the 1,500 to 2,000 concerts and putting them in the 8,000 seat room so they can spread everybody out. Okay. I think some of those concerts have been happening. So we'll see. We'll see if anything like that goes on. I mean. It's a good plan. Hey, I want you to feed your kids. I really appreciate um, your Yeah, yeah hopefully, you got stuff, hopefully you got some stuff you can use. And Call your me back ideas. Any more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really Thanks appreciate the, it. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, comments about my playing. It means a lot. It's cool. No, seriously, <laughs> very under underappreciated con considering the length of time you spent doing it and mm -hmm. the the amount of radio time and the amount of touring you've done, you know, it, definitely underappreciated. You, ne you need more credit. And that's that's part of what this is. I'm going to try to point people towards you and try to. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Try to try to get some positive energy your way. I uh, yep. I'm trying. We're all, we're all trying that. Hopefully just, you know, mentally get out of this, this rut. And yeah. Like definitely it's, it's funny because yeah, I have started doing this. I'm pulling out my old books, like my four way coordination. Books. Oh, look at that. You know, the ones at the end and, and, and tying myself up in knots. So at least I'm getting a little bit back into that because cause I, I haven't done this stuff, you know, since I was in college. Yeah. And then it's funny when you just start playing songs, you know, it, 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 these coordination books are always interesting because they're helpful but they're not very practical. You're not really going to use this stuff in the real world, but it is, it is cool to, it's, it's humbling. Of course you think, Oh, I'm doing pretty good these days. And then you open yeah. up this book and you start trying to play yeah. stuff. It literally ties you up in knots. It's just like, it's going to the gym. You know, you go to the gym yeah. and you, you work on it, your, your drum muscles and coordination and, and mm -hmm. things like that. And then, and then you exactly, do, yeah. your job. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, take care of yourself, man. I'm going to go feed the kids dinner. All right. I'll talk to you soon. I'll let you know when yeah. this is ready and I'll forward it to you. Awesome. Thanks for reaching out to me. Take care. Uh, and yeah, good luck with everything. It's, I, I want to see this channel and hopefully uh, follow your career. See, let's see when you're completely better. Drum recovery like network. Yeah. I hope, yeah. Um, they say two years, you're kind of going to be what you are. So I got I mean, yeah. six or yeah. seven months to work with. <laughs> yeah. Like I say, I just had my, my wrist surgery was, was built headed enough and I just, I couldn't play for, I don't even think it was quite six months. I think I was playing again after about four and a half months, but yeah, but definitely, you know how it is. It's like, you can't rush it. Mm. You know, I was sitting there going like, do not play. Cause if I grab a stick, it's going to hurt. Like, just don't do it. I'm not even going to try until the doctor gives me the okay to do it. So. Yeah. It's, it's, 
It's uh, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys every day. Yeah. I'll, uh, I won't be able to uh, do like the heartbeat do, 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 on the kick drum for weeks. And then all of a sudden I can do something crazy. It's like, okay. So yeah. Two steps forward, one step. Well, it's all the muscle memory still in there on you. It's just, it's just gotta find a My way to pop. brain it knows exactly what I'm supposed to do. Exactly. My, yeah. That's what's gotta be frustrating. My, uh, dorsiflexion is not a green. So. Yeah. Cool. See you, right, Mike. Man. I appreciate it. And hopefully when we're out in Seattle, yeah, you got to come out to a show. So absolutely hopefully we'll be out that way. One of these days. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you the casinos to hit up <laughs> your agent. <laughs> yeah. We played, we played a festival out there. I can't remember the name of the town, but it was about 45 minutes out of Seattle, but a festival there. Like it wasn't even a festival. It was like a state fair thing. Uh, yeah. A Puyallup, Puyallup, probably the state Washington state fair. Yeah. And we also played, um, what's the other place where some of the vineyards are? Um, Oh, the St. Michelle, that's a vineyard that like major bands play. What, yeah, what's the name of that town? Uh, it's like the, it's like a railroad town over the hill. We were there for a few days. Uh, the, the railroad museum's in Chehalis and then there's Centralia. That's south of Seattle about an hour. It's a, it, it's a big city. Why, why can't I think of the name of it? Bellingham. Um, uh, keep Vancouver going. Vancouver is further south. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's close to Seattle. It's not far at all. Tacoma. Not Olympia. No, not that close. <laughs> I'm gonna keep over the hill. I five. It's near Piala, but what is it? What's, it's like it's like right over the hill. And there's vineyards there and stuff, but it also I, I think it's also kind of a rundown like methy town as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's yeah that area. There's plenty of those. Yeah. yeah, just like there was in Southern California. It's like Barstow or something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well, I'll, cool. I'll, I'll look. I'll look at the name of the city and then I'll text it to you. Okay. See ya. <laughs>